Okay. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to Christ Reformed Presbyterian Church this morning. Are there any announcements? I think so. Is that better? Yeah, how about that? Should I just talk loud? Okay. Okay. Happy birthday to Lane today. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yep. Well, Pastor Nate is absent this morning, so uh, Herb, will, ruling elder, will be preaching this morning, and uh, so we'll get through it. We're gonna. It's gonna be a good. It's gonna be a good morning. So we're God's people gathering in His presence in His place. So on a beautiful day. Any other announcements? Okay, please stand if you are able for our opening hymn, number 67 in your songbook. Please join me in the Te Deum. We praise you, O God. We acknowledge you to be the Lord. All creation worships you, the Father everlasting. To you all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To you cherubim and seraphim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabbath, heaven and earth are in your glory. Please be seated. Now we'll sing another hymn, number 51 in your songbook.
Please join me in our opening invocation. Lord, we just humbly come before you this morning as a group of believers seeking your name, seeking your face. We always ask for peace and healing and, and strength, but Lord, I just ask this morning above all things that you um, allow us to feel your presence, allow us to have a faith and trust in you and our changing world, that we can continue to seek truth, seek good, and put on your armor to combat the evil ways of this world. I especially want to pray for Herb this morning that you just guide his mind, guide his speaking, and guide our hearts and guide our listening to his message this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Our confession and declaration, our confession of sin. Let us proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Let us therefore confess our sins as we worship our risen Lord. Heavenly Father, your Son's work of redemption is finished. While our flesh with its desires has been crucified for Christ, making us truly justified, we are yet encumbered with the residue of sin. We desire, yet we push back. We hope, yet there is grief and sadness. We possess, yet not fully. It is this waiting, this not yet, that in part causes our hearts to be heavy. In ways that we cannot fully understand, we sin, because we are yet sinners. Forgive us, O Lord, and renew us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. Please take a moment of silence for personal reflection and confession. His Declaration of Grace. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we have confessed together we are not what we should be. We are sinners. His law justly weighs in, making our conscience feel its transgression. Nevertheless, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ reign supreme. For the joy of gathering his people, and in our place, Christ has both fulfilled the law and has borne the fury of a just and holy wrath. Our guilt is gone. He has also bound the strong man, freeing us from his bondage. Therefore, with joyous shouts of hallelujah, I declare to you God's work through Christ alone, the forgiveness of sins. Amen. Please join me in our call to praise from Psalm 104. O Lord, how manifold are your works! In wisdom have you made them all. The earth is full of your creatures. The earth is the sea, great and wide, which teems with creatures innumerable, living things both small and great. There go the ships and Leviathan, which you formed to play in it. These all to you. When you give it to them, they gather it up. When you open your hand, they are filled with good things. When you hide your face, they are the same. When you take away their breath, they die and return to your dust. When you send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the ground. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. Who looks on the earth and it trembles? Who touches the mountains and they smoke? I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing to Him, for I rejoice in the Lord. 
Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Please hear our scripture reading. Whoever does not know the scriptures does not know the power of God, nor his wisdom. Ignoring the scriptures means ignoring Christ. Whoever wants to hear God speak should read Holy Scripture. The first reading is from the book of Genesis, chapter 11, verses 1 through 9. Hear the word of the Lord. Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. And they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. Then they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language, and this is only the beginning of what they will do. And nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and there confuse their language so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth and from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. The word of the Lord. The second reading is from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verses 1 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. And divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear, each of us in his own native language, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Familia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians, we hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, What does this mean? But others, mocking, said, They are filled with new wine. But Peter, standing with the eleven, lifted up his voice and addressed them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give ear to my words. For these people are not drunk, as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. But this is what was uttered through the prophet Joel. And in the last days it shall be, God declares, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. Even on my male servants and female servants, in those days I will pour out my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in the heavens above, and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the day of the Lord comes, the great and magnificent day. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Right pocket. 
Okay. Okay. Cut me up. Here. <laughs> Let me get this okay. over here. You good? All right. We are presuming we are good for the recording. It's not always great to presume, but I don't have any choice. So, The Gospel reading today is from John's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 8 through 17. Hear the word of the Lord. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, Show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do because I am going to my Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper, to be with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you, and he will be in you. The word of the Lord. And rise, and we'll sing a hymn, which is printed in your bulletin. I would say it's on the third to the last page. It's Jesus Loves Me. So please rise, and we'll sing the children's tunes. Um, one of them was that most people have only learned the first verse of this, like the children, and the rest of it is, has good theology as well. And I remember back when her mom died, and Curtis had suggested that we sing this at her funeral, and the reason why is because she had been a Sunday school teacher. And when we were there at that service, I was sitting next to my brother-in-law, and He's quite a bit older than I, and I had known that he had not been to church for years and years and years. And so I was surprised when we sang this that he was able to sing this song. And it struck me that this gets down in our hearts. That's one reason God gives us music, is to bring these things out. This is one of the things people can remember over the years. And so even though he had not been to church for decades, he was able to sing this with us. And I'd also point out that uh, the last verse is reminiscent of something that we often go over here together, especially in Sunday school, which is question number one from the Heidelberg Catechism. Thou hast bled and died for me, I will henceforth live for thee. Jesus, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones be long, they are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me this. Go, taking children on his knee, say, let them come to me. Yes, 
Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Jesus still today walking with me on my way wanting as a friend to give light and love to all who live yes jesus loves me yes jesus loves me yes jesus the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he who died. Heaven's gate to open wide. He will wash away my sin. <coughs> Let his little child come in. Yes, Jesus loves me. Jesus loves me, the Bible tells me so. Jesus loves me, he will say, close beside me all the way. For me, for thee. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Thank you, and please be seated. All right, let us pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, please be with me uh, as I preach from this pulpit. Be in your word and let it go forth and do its work according to your will. And please be with all those in the congregation and all those who hear this. Um, make it fruitful for them and bless us in this endeavor. And I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, the title of the sermon is The Ten Commandments. So I can probably squeeze that into 30 minutes, right? It's a narrow enough topic. No, I'm going to try to stay focused on what aspect of the Ten Commandments that I want to preach. But before I get to that, I want to go over a couple of readings that Becky read from us in the lectionary. The first one is from Genesis 11. It's the story of the Tower of Babel. And I hate to use the word story because it's not a story. It's narrative. It actually happened. That's what happened that's reflected and recorded in Genesis chapter 11. Now what that chapter relates to is rebellious, sinful man's endeavor to be as God, to be God's. And we see God's response to that sinful endeavor of mankind. And that's he comes down and he confuses the languages. He makes them so they can't understand each other. And then he disperses them across the face of the earth because that was his original intent for mankind, to be dispersed across the earth, not to gather together in a city and become as gods. That's not the purpose of God's creation of mankind. So there God confuses the language. Now, from the letter uh, Acts, uh, the second reading today, that's the new creation. The Tower of Babel was in the old creation. There is a new creation. And what is that? There, in Acts chapter 2, it's shortly after the rebellion, sinful man's endeavor to kill the Christ, which rebellious, sinful man accomplished cross. Christ was killed at the cross. 
that was accomplished by man? What was God's response to the killing of his only son? God's response is to repair the confusion of the languages by the power of the Holy Spirit. So you see in Genesis 11, God confused the languages. What does he do 50 days after Christ is killed? He restores and repairs the languages. Now, I want to read to you from Genesis 11 a bit. So Genesis 11, chapter 7, or chapter 11, verse 7, God says, come, let us go down, and there confuse their language, so that they may not understand one another's speech. So the Lord dispersed them from there over the face of all the earth, and they left off building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. Then, in Acts chapter 2, <clears throat> we see, from starting in verse 5, that Becky read to us from Acts. Now, there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And at this sound, the multitude came together, and they were bewildered, because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, Are not all those who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in his own native language? Parthians and Medes and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the parts of Libya belonging to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We all hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God, and all were amazed and perplexed, saying to another, one another, what does this mean? But others, mocking, said, they are filled with new wine. So, the Tower of Babel, that's the old creation. God confused the languages. With Christ is the new creation. Christ came a new creation. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. There's a new covenant in Christ, and we celebrate that new covenant each and every Sunday at the Lord's table. There is a new people. The church is created at Pentecost, okay? And Christ says, and the word promises, that Christ will have his church on earth until his second coming. <clears throat> numbers may rise, numbers may fall, but the remnant will always be here on earth. This is part of that already, not yet, that, that your pastor's fond of saying. Okay? Are there still, I don't know how many languages on this planet? Of course there are. Okay? And unless you know the language, you probably don't understand the language. So, it's an already, not yet. In the old order, God confused the languages. In the new order, in the new creation, God brought those languages together through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the, inaugura it's the inauguration of the new creation. Now, a couple of other things I want to comment on that fit the context of the sermon entitled The Ten Commandments. In the Gospel reading, uh, Christ says in John 14, verse 15, If you love me, you will keep my commandments. And then I want to look at the last verse of the Acts passage that Becky read. What does that read? And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord, shall be saved. So I think those verses are certainly in context with the title of the sermon, The Ten Commandments. Now I'm going to put you to work a little bit this morning. It's good for you. Um, the Ten Commandments are set forth, I would call it the second to the last page of your bulletin. So what I intend to do is ask you to read this with me. So let us read this together, The Ten Commandments. probably been a while since many of us have read the Ten Commandments. We've all heard of them. In fact, I think I might bring it up in session. We ought to have the Ten Commandments on one of the walls in here. That used to be standard fare for churches because that law needs to be before you. The gospel, yes, but that law needs to be before you at all times. So let's read these together. And it's from Exodus 
chapter 20, verses 1 through 21. And God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. For I, the Lord, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter your male servant, or your female servant, or your livestock, or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord honor your father and your mother, that your days be long in the land, the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall steal. Shall not bear witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Now when all the people saw the thunder and the flashes of lightning and the sound of the trumpet and the mountain smoking, the people were afraid, trembled, and they stood far off, said to Moses, you speak to us and we will listen, but do not let God speak to us lest we die. Moses said to the people, do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him be before you, that you may not sin. The people stood far off while Moses drew near to the thick darkness where God was. The word of the Lord. Thank you for reading that with me. So, these laws, these commandments came down on two tablets of stone inscribed by the very finger of God to Moses. Okay? Now, for the bad news. Death and hell is the consequence of violating any one of these commandments. Death and hell is the consequence of violating any one of these commandments. And Jesus even ratchets it, ratchets it, ratchets it up in the New Testament. When responding to one of the Pharisees, uh, actually a lawyer of the Pharisees, Jesus says, even thinking about committing adultery or even, even being angry with your brother is the same as committing adultery or committing murder from God's view of righteousness and justice. Now obviously, on our plane, the earthly plane, it is worse to murder someone than think about murdering someone. It is worse to commit adultery than think about committing adultery. But from God's righteousness and his holiness, thinking about that is a violation of the commandment. Okay? It's equal to acting on it, just the mere thinking of it. Now that should be a scary proposition to all of us. But, but, God is not only holy, just, and righteous, God is gracious and merciful. 
He will forgive you your sin and redeem you. The call of God is to repent, to turn, to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. You know I'm fond of this book, the Heidelberg Catechism, and I'm especially fond of question and answer one, and it wouldn't hurt any of us to read it daily, but um, you hear it from me probably every time I get a chance to be up here. So, from the Heidelberg Catechism, question one. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Answer, that I am not my own, but belong body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. Amen. One more ref uh, referral to the last verse in the Acts reading that we provided. Verse 21. And it shall come to pass that everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, the Ten Commandments, God's law. Okay? Ten Commandments, God's law. I want to read to you three or four verses from uh, Paul's epistle to Timothy, chapter 1. That's 1 Timothy, chapter 1, starting at verse 8. It's about the law of God. This is Paul. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, all in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. I dare say, when Paul says the law is good, he puts a condition on it. Let me just read that to you again and have that in your minds. Verse 8, now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Okay. There's, so obviously there's ways to use the law unlawfully. Now, what I'm focusing on today is what theologians and Christians for 2,000 years have called God's moral law, the Ten Commandments. As you're aware, Jesus rightly sums up the two tables of the law in his pronouncement of the greatest commandment. And you'll recall that is, you shall love the Lord God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's the second commandment. So the greatest commandment, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's the vertical plane. Tenth grade geometry, up and down, right? The second commandment is the horizontal plane, P-L-A-N-E, okay? That is love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus sums up the Ten Commandments in that way. Ligonier Ministries was started by Dr. R.C. Sproul, and many of you are familiar with Dr. R.C. Sproul and the Ligonier Ministry. The big Bible I lug around was a gift from Becky, um, and it's the Reformation Study Bible, and it's put out by Ligonier Ministries. And it has lots of good little articles, theological articles, interspersed throughout the scriptures. And this one's short, and it's powerful, and it sums up what I want to preach this morning, so I'm going to go through this. 
The threefold use of the law. The threefold use of the law. The moral law of God. Okay? Also the three purposes of the law. So the threefold use or the threefold purposes of the law. Every Christian wrestles with the question, how does the Old Testament law relate to my life? Is the Old Testament law irrelevant to Christians? Or is there in some sense we are still bound by portions of it? As the heresy of antinomianism, that means anti-law or lawlessness, that's a heresy, lawlessness, it's all grace and lawlessness, that's a heresy becomes even more pervasive in our culture, the need to answer these question, questions grows increasingly urgent. <coughs> the Reformation was founded on grace and not upon the law. Yet, the law of God was not repudiated by the Reformers. John Calvin, for example, wrote what has become known as the threefold use of the law. In order to show the importance of the law for the Christian life. So, three bold purposes of the moral law of God. The first purpose of the law is to be a mirror. On the one hand, the law of God reflects and mirrors the perfect righteousness of God. The law tells us much about who God is. Perhaps more important, the law illumines, illumines human sinfulness. Augustine wrote, the law orders that we, after attempting to do what is ordered, and so feeling our weakness under the law, may learn to implore the help of grace. The law highlights our weakness so that we might seek the strength found in Christ. Here the law acts as a severe schoolmaster who drives us to Christ, drives us to the cross. Now, so the first purpose of the law is as a mirror. The second purpose for the law is the restraint of evil. The law, in and of itself, cannot change human hearts. It can, however, serve to protect the righteous from the unjust. Calvin says this purpose is by means of its fearful denunciations and the consequent dread of punishment to curb those who, unless forced, have no regard for rectitude or justice. The law, the law allows for a limited measure of justice on this earth until the last judgment is realized. So the second use of the law is a restraint of evil. The third use of the law, or the third purpose of the law, is to reveal what is pleasing to God. A born again, as born-again children of God, the law enlightens us as to what is pleasing to our Father, whom we seek to serve. The, law delight, or the Christian delights in the law of God as God himself delights in it. Jesus said, which I've said twice already today, from John 14, verse 15, If you love me, keep my commandments. This is the highest function of the law, to serve as an instrument for the people of God to give him honor and glory. By studying or meditating on the law of God, we attend the school of righteousness. We learn what pleases God and what offends him. The moral law that God reveals in scripture is always binding on us. Our redemption from the curse of God's law, not from our duty to obey it. We are redeemed from the curse of God's law, but not from our duty to obey it. We are justified, not because of our obedience to the law, but in order that we might become obedient to God's law. To love Christ is to keep his commandments. To love God is to obey his law. So, some again of that. Threefold use of the law. The law is a mirror. The law is a restraint of evil and it reveals what is pleasing to God and is a standard for Christian living. Now I want to focus a bit on the second use of the law, the restraint of evil. That is sometimes called the civil use of the commandments. Frankly, it's what should be in our statutes and in our law codes. 
Okay? And it used to be in a great part in this country. Okay? The civil use of the law, the restraint of evil. How do we know what is good? How do we know what is evil? How do we know what is right? How do we know what is wrong? The answer is simple. God's law. God's moral law. God's standard. Okay. A healthy society supports the use of God's law in its civil and criminal law codes. Let me repeat that. A healthy society supports the use of God's law in its civil and criminal law codes. Contrarywise, an unhealthy society puts into law what? Sinful man's ever-changing definitions of what is good and what is evil and what is right and what is wrong. And we have that in spades in 2022 right here in Goshen County, right here in the city of Torrington, right, state of Wyoming, country of America. Okay. I was reading an article on the threefold use of the law, and in the article, the gentleman that wrote it said, he found this as a slogan in a liberal church. Think about this. It's a simple three-word word slogan. Love over rules. Love over rules. Okay. Now I know that those who, I call them the rainbow jihad, that element in our society that is pushing homosexuality and transgenderism and everything everywhere they go, uh, they have a little slogan, it's called hashtag love wins. If you haven't heard that, hashtag love wins, okay? Love over rules, love over rules. That's sort of the philosophy and the affirmation of the liberal church these days. And it seems to be the affirmation of liberal government policies related to sexual immorality. Okay. Cohabitation. Is cohabitation, living to a man and a woman, living together without the benefit of, the mar of marriage, is that lawful under God's commandments? No. That's adultery, fornication. Not lawful. But is it lawful to do it in the state of Wyoming? Yeah. You don't have to get married. You can live together. Right? Didn't used to be. You know, I learned a lot from my father, who was the Goshen County Sheriff here for 16 years when I was a kid. I literally grew up under the jail here in Torrington. And I'd patrol with him. It was kind of like Andy of Mayberry. He was Andy and I was Opie. Okay? And he'd teach me stuff. And some things I remember. And one of them is, Herb, it's against the law to live together without being married. Okay? It's against the law to do that. He wasn't talking about the law of God, although that's true. He's talking about the civil law. Okay? What about no-fault divorce? Who's ever heard that term, no-fault divorce? You know when it came into effect in Wyoming? Anybody have any idea? Year after I was out of high school, 1973, the Wyoming legislature passed no fault divorce. Prior to that, if you wanted to go to the divorce court and get a divorce, you had to prove grounds for a divorce. I call them the three A's. You had to prove adultery, abandonment, or serious abuse. Or that court wasn't empowered, did not have the jurisdiction to enter a divorce decree without one or all three or two of those grounds. Okay? Then it became irreconcilable differences, which means nothing. If you like your coffee black and she likes it with cream, that's an irreconcilable difference. The court can grant you a divorce. Okay? Interestingly, since those were the grounds for a divorce prior to 1973, what are the biblical grounds for divorce? The same three things. Adultery, abandonment, or serious abuse. Okay. Wonder where the legislature got the idea to put that in the civil divorce code. Think they just sat in a room and reasoned together and came up with that? No. Came right out of God's law. That's what used to happen down there in Cheyenne in the older days. Okay. Doesn't happen there so much anymore. 
Now, what has the United States Supreme Court done in the sexual morality arena? In 2015, it just dictated, declared, that homosexual marriage, same-sex marriage, shall be the law in all 50 states. Just pronounced it. Not a single governor out of 50 did anything about that except went along with it. Okay? That's where same-sex marriage comes from. Pronouncement by nine Ivy League trained justices that sit there in Washington. That was followed up in 2020 with a pronouncement where you have to recognize that men can turn into women. Okay? Especially if you're an employer. So if your male employee decides he's a woman, you have to recognize that under consequence and penalty of law. Now, the people that want to push this then take that argument to everything else. Well, the Supreme Court says that men can turn into women, therefore, wherever that issue comes up in any way, shape, or form, that's the law. That's what we have now. Now, let me ask you, rhetorically, are these modern rules that I just described, are they more important? Are they more loving than God's commandments, his moral commandments, his moral guardrails? You know how safe you are living in this world if you pretty much stay within God's guardrails of his morality? You are safe from sexual diseases. You are safe from any number of things, okay? if you stay within God's guardrails. Now, none of us does that. We're sinners. Okay? We can't meet the requirements of the law. And that's when we go to the grace that's offered in Christ at the cross. But as a Christian, when you're in Christ, that's your standard. That's what you're shooting for. Okay? Now, you will fall, as we say each and every Sunday, in our confession of sin, because we are yet sinners. If the moral law of God is followed for the most part, I assure you that the individuals that compose the society are safer individually and better off, more productive, and whatever else we want of people. And the society as a whole will also be safer and more productive and beneficial if we follow God's law. God ordains authorities and jurisdictions he does that in his word. Now, Christ is where? He's sitting at the right hand of God the Father. That's where he is. And what's he doing up there? He's ruling and reigning. Because Christ is sovereign over all. Did I say he's sovereign over some? I did not. Christ is sovereign over all. And Christ is sovereign Lord of the church. Christ is sovereign Lord of the family. And Christ is sovereign Lord of the state. And when I say state, I don't necessarily mean the state of Wyoming, although I do mean that. When I say the state, I mean government generically. Okay? Christ is Lord of, that, Lord of that too. I want to read to you uh, some verses from Romans chapter 13 one of the larger, theologically profound, they all are, but very deep letter of Paul in Romans, Romans chapter 13, where he talks about the authorities, governmental authorities. And this is what the Apostle Paul says about that. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Let me read that again. Okay. Authorities. What are authorities? The government, the mom, the dad, the employer, the teacher, the principal. All those people are authority figures, right? They're the authorities. So let me read what Paul says again. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities 
resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Let me stop right there. For rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Now, by what standard is Paul measuring good conduct? God's law. By what standard is Paul measuring bad conduct? God's law. What standard would Paul ever use except that? Okay. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what is good and you will receive his approval. For he is God's servant for your good. A couple of things there. Again, by what standard of good? Also, the governmental authority is what? He is God's servant for your good. And I think the Greek word that they use there for servant, he's a deacon. Did you know that your dog catcher, your chief of police, your sheriff, your whoever is an authority, is God's servant, God's deacon for your good? Did you know that? That's the way it is. It's not taught much anymore. They all think, many of them think they're out on their own mark. Okay. They're God's servants, God deacons for good. But if you do wrong, how are we going to determine what's wrong? God's law. If you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, again, servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Do you remember what I read to you from the threefold use of the law on the second use? Uh, the last line in the paragraph on the second use uh, as a restraint for evil, the law allows for a limited measure of justice on this earth until the last judgment is realized. Okay, that's the restraint of evil. All nations should, but don't, as you know, implement God's law as the standard for morality in their civil and criminal law codes. I want to recommend this um, article, and I took from this article, I found it online, it's from uh, WheatonRecord.com, it's by Jeremy Chong, he's the theology columnist, and it's dated February 1 of 2022. And Wheaton College is in Illinois, and if my memory is right, David Greenwald, who we used to attend church with in Lingle, I believe either went there or graduated from there, but he's from there. And then Dr. Moo, who is coming here for the fall seminar in September, is also a professor at Wheaton College. Okay. Anyway, there's this quote in Blanchard Hall, and Blanchard Hall is a famous building on the campus of Wheaton College in Illinois. And it's a quote by a uh, gentleman named Reverend Dr. Jonathan Blanchard, who was a 19th century abolitionist. And he was also a Presbyterian pastor, and he is credited for establishing Wheaton College. And on that wall in the Blanchard building on that campus, it says this, Society is perfect, where what is right in theory exists in fact, where practice coincides with principle, and the law of God is the law of the land." Unquote. Okay. So to sum this up, the threefold use of God's law, it's a mirror. You are unrighteous under the law. Flee to Christ. Flee to the cross. Repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's the mirror of the law. It's a restraint of evil. And I want to reread Jonathan Blanchard's quote. Society is perfect where what is right in theory exists in fact, 
where practice coincides with principle, and the law of God is the law of the land. And then the third use of the law, purpose, use, a standard for Christian behavior. Obedience is pleasing to God. Obedience is demanded by God. John 14, 15, Christ says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Now, law without gospel is cruel. If I were to stand up here and just preach those Ten Commandments to you and pat you on the back and say, go get them, you would utterly fail. Okay? Each and every time you tried to do that. So preaching just the law without the gospel of the grace in Christ is cruel. It's cruel. And I don't ever want to be cruel. Let me read to you Paul's several verses to young Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 8. Now we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully. Understanding this, that the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and sinners, for the unholy and profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, for murderers, the sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine, in accordance with the gospel of the glory of the blessed God with which I have been entrusted. So I told you I'm going to focus a bit on the right use and the wrong use of the law. One wrong use of the law is for you to attempt to comply with the law to earn your salvation because you will fail. You've already failed. You're a born sinner. You failed when you come out of your mother's womb, for one thing. But if you endeavor through your own self-righteousness and pulling yourself up by your bootstraps to be made right with God, that's the wrong use of the law. The law is good if it's used correctly, if it's used lawfully. Don't use it unlawfully. If you don't know already, and after I read it the first time, you'll know for sure the second time. I'm going to read to you again Heidelberg Catechism, question one and answer one. Question one. What is your only comfort in life and in death? Answer. That I am not my own, but belong, body and soul, in life and in death, to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood, and he has set me free from the tyranny of the devil. He also watches over me in such a way that not a hair can fall from my head without the will of my Father in heaven. In fact, all things must work together for my salvation. Because I belong to him, Christ, by his Holy Spirit, assures me of eternal life and makes me wholeheartedly willing and ready from now on to live for him. May it be so. Amen. And now, if you'll rise, we will do the Nicene Creed. It's in the front part of your songbook. And this is, this is not just a recitation of the words. This is a confession. This is because you confessing what you believe. So, let me get to it and I'll lead us. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, 
and of all things visible and invisible. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God. He will come again, glory, to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Thank you. Please be seated. Do you want me to stand by you? Yeah. yeah okay. Let me get on this side because I have to have it when I do communion. There we go. Uh, we'll have the prayers of the people now. This is an opportunity to put forth your requests, concerns, and prayers to God our Father, but know also that God hears our silent cries. When we feel powerless, His Spirit intercedes on our behalf with groanings too deep for words. I will start with a prayer and, and please join in as you, as you feel led to do so. And when there is silence, I will, I will lead you in the Lord's Prayer. Lord, we just thank you so much for this day and this opportunity that we had to, to hear Herb uh, preach your word in, a, in, a, in an understanding of, of the law and of the gospel. And we pray that we can find a balance in adhering to your law and fulfilling your law, but also understanding our brokenness and our mm -hmm. sinful ways and that we have a Savior, Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. And we pray for uh, the unhealthy in this world and in, the, in this congregation. We pray that you watch over us and keep us safe. You heal. You give comfort. You give strength. And we just pray that each and every one of us can continue to have faith in you and Folks in this community can be led to truth and can, can be led to you. And we just pray that people can feel that today and, and feel that throughout their lives. Lord, I lift, want to lift up the Norbrainer with cancer and also Donna Phipps with cancer. Lord God, I pray for all of you caregivers, both professional and, and family and friends. And I just pray that you will guide them, give them wisdom, and give them energy and strength and compassion. And please be with those caregivers and help them to receive what they need as they serve you by serving others. Mm. I'm going to lift up Tim Walker. Please join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, Father in heaven, heaven, hallowed be your name. <clears throat> Kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever amen <clears throat> Praise God. i'll do this 
and then you do this. For this? Yeah. So when I do, after the communion, I'll give you this to you. Ye heavenly host, praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Therefore, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. This is the feast of victory for our God. Alleluia. Alleluia, Alleluia. We have visitors today, so I want to explain this process. Here we do this by intinction. I will go through the words of institution, and then I will present a plate to Lane, who will stand here, and I will stand here. Uh, he's the bread, I'm the wine. It's not really wine, it's grape juice. Um, those are welcome to the table who are sinners, who are in a repentant state of mind, who are not living in open and notorious public sin, you are welcome to this table. This table is for sinners. It's not for the righteous. If you're in Christ, you're made righteous by your being in him. But we're all sinners, so sinners are welcome to this table. I see that there are children. That's up to the parents. If, if they determine if their children are responsible and capable of communion, so that is left up to the parents of these children. So. 
With that, I will commence with the words of institution. The sacrament of the Lord's Supper. The Lord's Supper was instituted by Jesus on the night of his betrayal. It is to be celebrated until the end of the world as a perpetual remembrance of what he did for mankind on the cross. The Lord's Supper is a seal of all those benefits of Calvary for believers and signifies the spiritual growth and signifies their spiritual growth and nourishment. It is a bond and a pledge of the communion of believers with Jesus Christ and with each other as parts of the church. From 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. The Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let us pray. Lord, by your grace, please bless the bread and the wine, set it apart from ordinary use to holy use and mystery. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took the bread, and when he had blessed and broken it, he gave it to his disciples, as I give you this bread in his name. After the same manner, he took the cup, our Savior, and having given thanks, as has been done in his name, he gave it to his disciples, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for many for the remission of sins. The body of Christ given for you, the blood of Christ shed for you. And Carol. Christ shed for you. And come when you are led to come. Blood of Christ shed for you. 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 Amen. Blood of Christ shed for you, Curtis. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Blood of Christ shed for you. 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 Blood of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ given for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Blood of Christ shed for you. Amen. Please stand if you are able for our closing hymn, Jesus Christ is Risen Today, number 40, 243 in your songbook.
please remain standing for our benediction. From Exodus chapter 20, verse 20, the words of Moses, Do not fear, for God has come to test you, that the fear of him may be before you, that you may not sin. And the words of God to Moses, found in Romans chapter 9, verse 15, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and compassion on whom I will have compassion. God shows mercy and compassion, and God serves justice, but God is not unjust. Go in peace knowing that. Go in, go in peace knowing that judgment does not lie on our shoulders. True saving faith within ourselves is beyond our abilities, but help us to fulfill the law lawfully, help us to adhere to the moral law, and ultimately help us to understand our desperation for grace. For it is by grace that you have been saved. Amen. Amen. There is some version of refreshment over here. Through that door.